what an honor it is to speak with you. And I'm going to go into the reasons. There's a, a deep connection between my family and Rutgers. And given that this is the 250th anniversary, I'd like to take uh, about 10 minutes and explain uh, that connection and how ultimately it informed lots of my life choices and, and uh, ambitions uh, in life. Uh, I really have two talks here. One is on liberalism and social justice. And these are two concepts in my own graduate work. I ended up having some deep qualms about uh, the connection, the intersection, and really started having qualms about the conceptual coherence of social justice. Uh, and even to the point that I, well, anyway, that's one talk. The other is on the crypto revolution. And for those who don't know, you may probably have heard of Bitcoin. But the, the main event of Bitcoin isn't Bitcoin. The main event of Bitcoin is the technology underneath Bitcoin is turning out to be incredibly disruptive. It's going to be more disruptive than the internet. I started saying this two years ago. And as generally happens, people put pictures of me in the paper with UFOs coming out of my head, Bitcoin. And they don't get the point. This is thing, and philosophers should be tuned into this. This is, a, well, the bank, Paribas, the fourth biggest bank in the world, came out last summer and said this is a bigger invention than the steam engine and the internal combustion, combustion engine combined. It has deep implications for political philosophy and the context within which we are going to think about political philosophy. So given that there, I actually would just like, so I know how to adjust my timing, I might not be able to get through both sides of that talk. I see there's more, I discover there's more economic monetary historians here than I expected who may have a diff, different interest. So if you had, just by a, a quick show of hands, if you had your choice between, on the one hand, hearing a talk on liberalism and social justice and the contradictions between the two, please raise your hand. And if you wanted to hear a talk on the crypto revolution, and how this Bitcoin stuff is going to change history as we know. It's going to be bigger than the internet. And I say that as, <laughs> unlike Al Gore, I was not there quite for the beginning of the internet, but I was there pretty close. And we knew we were doing something pretty big, but this is going to be even bigger. Who would rather hear about the crypto revolution? Okay. Well, once I heard that we had a bunch of monetary historians here, I thought that that's probably... <laughs> Well, let me, take the, uh, let me take choice C. I'm going to start by telling you about um, spending about 10 minutes. The truth is each of those talks can be gotten through in about 10 to 12 minutes. All the, uh, uh, I, I may reverse the order of a section in case we run out of time. So first I'm going to talk, gee, so am I going to be fighting a timing? Uh, this connection between teachers, uh, teaching Rutgers and the Byrne family, and since it's being videotaped, and I understand this is, I just did an interview about the 250 year anniversary, I'd like to talk about this from a, for a, about 10 or 12 minutes. There is a uh, saying in Chinese, Shi Gao Yu Jun, a teacher is higher than the emperor. And I was a student in China. And I remember once I'm in China, after Mao took over, they wiped out all the honorifics. China's full of honor, honor, you know, little sister and big brother is how you speak to everybody. They took all of them away. You had to be comrade. All with the exception of teacher. You could be comrade street sweeper, comrade chairman. All with the exception of a teacher. And I once mistakenly referred to one of my teachers in China by comrade teacher. There was this big gasp in the crowd, and people explained to me, you know, in our system, a teacher's higher than the emperor. I come from a family who feels very much that way. Uh, in fact, I, the best way to describe it, I remember in Fy Richard Feynman wrote a book called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. It's a wonderful book, but he talks at one point about this funny thing. He's, his mom happened to meet a general and a professor on the same day, and she was equally excited. And he thought how strange that is, that someone would be equally excited to hear of, to meet a professor and a, student, and, a, and a general on the same day. I come from a family that that would be, it, it, would, be exact, it would absolutely be more exciting to meet a professor than a general. So revered was education in our family. 
How that came about, I'm going to start with the Fasori Evangelicus Gymnasium. This is a tree that some Lutheran uh, missionaries formed in Budapest in 1825, a school, tiny school. It, uh, it had an exceptional leader starting around 1880, and it generated a stream of unbelievable graduates came out of this school from 1905 to 1920. This little school in Budapest generated uh, everyone from Johann von Neumann, uh, uh, John Harsani, who, um, you know, von Neumann, arguably the greatest mathematician in the last century, Harsani, uh, Wegner, won a Nobel in, in physics, Harsani in economics, on and on and hundreds of musicians and, and artists, as well as science. Edward Teller came out of this. Janis Kornai came out of here decades later. Um, little tiny school in Budapest. What really happened was this. Jewish kids were not allowed in the gymnasium system in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And they, this was one of the few that took them. And they moved to Budapest, and they would live in the neighborhood. And this neighborhood turned into a remarkable neighborhood filled with retired mathematicians and physicists and such who would take in five or six kids as pensioners, send them to the school, and then tutor them in the afternoon. So in a sense, a market was created. Kids and families got to choose their teachers. The outcome was this greatest flourishing of human capital since Athens. This, this unbelievable flourishing that occurred for about 15 years out of this little school. One of the graduates uh, in the 19, must have been about 1930, was a guy named Joshua Barlez. Joshua Barlez, who I could obtain no picture for him, the closest I could do was your colleague Stephen Ferry, is a mathematician here. Joshua Barlez came here, finished his PhD, and taught my dad. My father was Rutgers, class of 51, from Patterson, New Jersey, via Wildwood. And then his brother came, Air Force ROTC as well, and they, uh, uh, and all my cousins and such have come to Rutgers. So there's this, you see a lot of burns in and out of the Rutgers campus. Uh, my father had this exceptional relation. My father was a math major, had this exceptional relationship with Joshua Barlez that he spoke about all his life. And we grew up, for us, coming to Rutgers was the big trip and learn, you know, singing the song on the banks of the old Eritan and such. There was a, so there's this deep affinity between our family and, and Rutgers. Um, something funny happened to my dad. He got out of here, went into the Air Force evidently ticked off some general, he got posted to an ice station on the north slope of Greenland for three years. <laughs> and if you knew my dad, you'd understand why. Some general did. And came back and did a master's in actuarial science and became a life insurance actuary. Was working his way up in the travelers, got passed over for a job on grounds that he felt were because he was Catholic. And, and at the time, there were sort of no, certainly no Jewish people above a certain level. In a, in a, Hartford is really the last city in the country that was, might even still have a taste of this. And you couldn't be Catholic and rise above a certain level, believe it or not. That world seems really strange to young people today, but that's not so many generations ago, or two generations ago. Um, got passed over and quit very angrily and got headhunted a couple months later to take over a small southern insurance company that was failing, it was in car insurance. And he'd been in life insurance, didn't know anything about it, and they hired him to take it through bankruptcy. And he went uh, and joined it, and about a, a month into it, realized it could be saved from bankruptcy if he acted vigorously. And that meant there were 10,000 people he had to cut it to 3,000 people within 30 days. He, he was a uh, just tremendous cost cutter. Anyway, he saved this little insurance company. And he was there about two months when he got a phone call that some funny guy in Omaha was starting to want to accumulate stock and wanted to meet with him. My father went down to meet with this fellow, 
in Washington. Guy flew in. We'd never, we had our order in, and I, we had our order in for our first new car in our family, a $7,000 station wagon. And I'll never forget, my dad sat up all night till dawn with this fellow, came back and canceled the order for the car and sunk that money into stock in this guy's company. That guy, meanwhile, went out and sunk 40% of his net worth the next day into my dad's company. That guy was Warren Buffett, and no one had ever heard of him at the time. And it was Buffett, and the company was Geico. And the reason this was all happened in 1976, and Geico made it through, and, and Buffett later said my pop was the greatest general manager in America. He was, he had, and pardon me, I can say this, I hope, as a three-time cancer survivor. Buffett always has very direct metaphors. Buffett said, my father was the master of what he called the cancer model, that he could look at an organization and somewhat unfeelingly just look at it and see, well, if these are the pieces that I, if I carve out, they can all live together and cut everything else away. This, this thing will remain. And he could sort of had this very... Well, a gene in them that let him step in and do that. And that's a very tough thing to do. And I seem to have the same gene because it's what more often or often or occasionally has been my lot in life and business is I'm the guy who steps into something that's almost dead and says, what can you carve out and carve everything else away and the left will rest will live. So I got very lucky in that when I was 13, this guy started staying with us. And again, no, he'd never, his name had never been in the paper. Uh, and he would start staying with us and teaching me, teaching me about life, teaching me about the stock market, teaching me about politics. As you probably know, Buffett is sort of a left of center uh, uh, fellow politically. He would teach me things like about the progressive in consumption tax and why that's the superior method. And so, we just, so this was my rabbi in life, and that's what I call him. And we... Uh, and he's been my great Dutch uncle through life. So I had some unbelievable tailwind, of course. And then I was in college when I saw an article in the paper the first time that mentioned my friend. And I thought, gee, this is, he's starting to get famous. And it's been funny ever since watching this myth appear of Warren Buffett to me. He's just been this fellow since I was 13 who kind of took me under his wing and I ended up working for him. I had another series, I'll just name great professors, Walter Senate Armstrong, uh, David Lubon and Judy Lichtenberg, who were two philosophy professors now at Georgetown, who really took me under their wing. And the effect they had on my life is what caused my parents to come. And by the way, that stock, that $7,000 of car that my dad did forego, turned into, you know, that was Geico, I mean, that was Berkshire at about 65 bucks a share. So that turned into a couple hundred million dollars. And that became this fortune with which my father went around and sort of gave big legacies and, and my parents did and, and gave it all away, by the way. He, uh, you know, his goal was to die with just enough money left over for my mom to take care of her and then be gone. And that's what he did with it. He gave away hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, Etchemendi, I look back, I know all these names have become, to me, these were my, my grad student professors. Nancy Cartwright taught me philosophy of science. I stored Hampshire, I was his teaching assistant. Partha Dasgupta, who's like a Amartya Sen in, uh, about development economics, had a huge influence on me. Ken Arrow, I got to know Ken Arrow at Stanford, and we became friends. And he, I, we, it's, it, we had a relationship, something like I did with David and Judy, where just by, uh, it was sort of the, the heavy, it, interactions and him recommending a book and then I'd go back and talk to him about the book. I found out that I could learn much better osmotically that way. John Dupre, and this is I'd say great friend, my thesis advisor, he's what he would describe as your, your traditional British socialist, uh, is how he describes himself. He's a philosopher of science and he's all about anti-reductionism. And this is when I started having qualms about what I was learning in philosophy because I started finding his political, uh, typical British socialism as being extremely reductionist. And I never understood how he could be both this anti-reductionist philosopher of science and uh, believe in the po uh, political agenda he did. And then another Rutgers graduate, Milton Friedman. And he became my uh, great friend the last eight years of his life. And I 
I saw Rose, she pa passed a few years after he did, uh, and lead the Milton Rose Friedman Foundation. So he would sit and talk to me about things like, you know, the flat tax and the negative tax and why you should couple them together. And I know this is terrible intellectual name dropping, but one of the most interesting periods of my life, there was about a six year period where I used to take arguments back and forth between Milton Friedman and Warren Buffett. And I'd say, you know, well, Mr. Buffett, Milton says this and that. And he says, well, you should tell him this and that. And I would, next time I saw Milton, I'd drop, I'd say this, and he'd, he'd patiently explain how to correct Warren Buffett on something. And I went back and forth, never, I would say, nobody ever got, uh, except, uh, uh, no, uh, maybe the one time I saw, I've seen Milton bested in, a, in an argument, of course, with me as the medium, it, it, it's not a trustworthy. But Buffett said something that stuck in my mind. He said, uh, I, I took some argument from Milton to him. It was about actual uh, currency, floating currencies. And Buffett said, you know, Pat, you, when you get to know these economists, never forget that economists love to see the world in terms of smoothly intersecting lines that smoothly adjust and all this stuff. But in reality, there's psychology, and human psychology makes those lines stick. And they stick and they stick in a ways economists don't get. And these pressures, these architect architectonic pressures develop, and they develop and they, they grow and they grow until someday somewhere an archduke gets shot. And then when that happens, everything cracks. And they, that's the way Buffett talks. Someday somewhere an archduke gets shot, and then everything <laughs> cracks. And I guess I think that he was right. It's one of the, in that whole period of my life, that's the only time I remember thinking, well, I've never, anyway. Uh, uh, and Sowell became a huge influence on me. Thomas Sowell, who I think, I, th I wish political philosophers spent more time treating his work. He's an economist. Uh, and in particular, he asked us to think in terms of how social philosophy, in terms of when you're social institutions, how difficult, how expensive is it to centralize and process information? And I'm just going to basically go through, if you, if you think knowledge is costly to centralize, you want self-organizing systems and common law and markets, things that operate on decentralized information to forego that cost, a beehive being a good icon. And if you believe that knowledge and information is cheap to centralize, you tend to favor systems or you can imagine systems that are designed by experts and solutions to social problems that are run centrally by experts and legislation, central planning and so forth. And that's what I think of as the Dilbert model vision of the world. But a less, mm, uh, a more neutral way to describe it is do you see the world in terms of incentives or intent? Uh, do you measure social policy or evaluate social proposals in terms of the intent or in terms of the incentives? Uh, now, just to t let you know, I haven't thrown away all this philosophy education. It's gone, it's very much been involved in the work I've done. Like we've created the largest fair, I think it's the largest fair trade group in the world. We've done over, well, a few years ago, we reached 100 million. We have. 10,000 artisans in 55 countries, most of them female that we focus on. Uh, I also, since I'm gonna say a few things you might disagree with, I'm gonna say the left was, I'll, I found some things you will, well, I don't wanna assume everyone's on the left or anything. In academia, in my days in academia, people tend to be more on the left. Certainly the environment. The left was correct about the environment all along. Uh, and I think that Pigouvian taxes are the way to go to internalize costs and so on and so forth. Uh, here's a moral on the environment. If, and I remember, and if you make something priceless, people consume it as though it's free. When you drop the price, people consume more, and when you drop it to zero, they consume a lot of it. So the idea, I mean, I used to sit in philosophical discussions in the 80s where people would be opposed to uh, what Reagan was then calling market-based solutions to pollution. Now we have a president who's doing the same thing. That point of the carbon tax, cap and trade, I think a carbon tax, I think a simple carbon tax is better than cap and trade, because once you have cap and trade, you get squeezes and volatility, and it's a big gift to Wall Street. Um, 
but a simple carbon DAC. Uh, and I walked out of all this with my two main missions in life are how do you, to move society forward, it's all about how do you fix the systems by which we create human capital and those by how we marry them to financial capital. I think we gotta do everything else right. You gotta defend borders and rule of law and stuff. But the two systems I care about are how do you form human capital, which means education, how do you marry it to financial capital, which means Wall Street. Those are the two systems I really care about. And uh, I'm more lately known as the Bitcoin Messiah and the scourge of Wall Street due to some work I've, I've done. About 2000, when you're a public company CEO, you're out there mingling with all these people. And I quickly, by 04, I knew that I smelled skunk in a variety of places on Wall Street. I was out there mingling with brokers and hedge funds and regulators. I knew a whole bunch of crazy stuff that was going on. I was asked to take part, and I just went public about it all. And I see a couple people here in this room who actually were part of that distant supporters in that fight have shown up, a, a firefighter from Long Island who supported me all along, and uh, Mark Rosenblum, who was a native, and, uh, and Carolyn works here for the dean. But uh, so I became kind of a public, I was, I was told in 07, you're the most hated man I've ever, a, a large head fund guy told me, you know, you're the most hated man I've ever known in all my life. You could kill people and we wouldn't hate you in this town. Like we hate you now, Patrick. I mean, it was really unbelievable what, what was going on back there. And it's just, I had figured out that there was a bunch of no good nicks, about 15 hedge funds working with a couple prime brokers that were up to, they were no good nicks without going into details, that the regulators were asleep at the switch, if not in on it, and that the system was gonna crash. And I started saying this in 05, and the press started running photos of me with UFOs coming out of my head to say, you know, this guy says Wall Street has Washington under their thumb, that's crazy, it's a conspiracy theory that Wall Street has conspiracy theory. So uh, now, since you've voted for a uh, more emphasis on the crypto, I'm going to jump to the crypto uh, because this is something I think, just like I'm around on Wall Street trying to get, um, I've been for about two years waking some people up to what's coming and now they got the joke, by the way. In the last six months, Wall Street's got the joke. This is an extinction event for many of the large companies you know on Wall Street. This is an extinction event. And that's how they're, th six months ago, the head of JP Morgan came out and said, this technology is going to eat our lunch, eat Wall Street's lunch. BNP Paribas, the French bank came out, they're the ones who said, this is bigger than the internal combustion engine. And, uh, and, uh, 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 so I'm, I'm going to walk you through why this has such profound implications for, for philosophers, but no one's sort of picking up on it yet. It's only like in the last six months this is even breaking through consciousness on Wall Street. Let me remind you that as the world melted down in 08, Greenspan was asked to testify to before Congress. And he came and the left jumped on a little quote he said here, I think, somewhat missing the point, because they say, well, Greenspan shows markets don't work. But listen carefully to what he says. There are additional regulatory changes that this breakdown of the central pillar of competitive markets requires in order to return to stability, particularly in the areas of fraud, settlement, and securitization. So we all know what fraud is, <coughs> Bernie Madoff, securitization, Mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, this stuff. If you haven't seen The Big Short, recommend that movie, by the way. Uh, I'm going to tell you what settlement means. And that sounds dull as dishwasher with the water, but I promise if you can stick with me for about eight minutes, you're going to enjoy it. And, uh, well, that you'll get something out of it and why this has such philosophical uh, implications. Settlement is the legal name for this process. If grandpa is buying a baseball glove from this guy, you know, they make the deal, but the act of changing money for the baseball club is called settlement. It happens on Wall Street too. When he's 
Grandpa is buying stock from a hedge fund. The act of exchanging the money for, they make the deal on the exchange, but the act of exchange, actually trading the money in stock is called the settlement process. Now, of course, Grandpa doesn't speak directly to hedge funds. Each is represented in our market by a broker. And you got money in stock trading hands among them or between them. But historically, it's a bit more complicated. And only old timers here might even know this reference. But it, up through the 1960s, for all the history of Wall Street and up through the 1960s, there were people on bicycles called jobbers who ran around or bicycled around downtown Wall Street with sacks of certificates. And broker to broker, and they'd show up and, okay, we had a client who sold your guy 100 shares, and here's her certificate for 150, and we clipped this corner, we both initial it, and there was this crazy paper system. The 1960s, volume on Wall Street quadrupled, and the guys on bicycles couldn't keep up, and the whole thing log jammed. And the old timers may remember something called the, if you have, uh, the Great Wall Street Paperwork Crisis. Believe it or not, Wall Street shut down. Was sh it was only open four days a week and three hours per day when it was open. That was to give it time for all this to catch up. It had completely come unspooled. And the industry, the SEC, called the war brokers together, and they said, we want to have some sort of peer-to-peer -peer electronic system. And the DTC and the SEC did something different. There were two alternatives. They insisted on a different system. It was called immobilization. And they created an institution. It was actually already a back office at New York Stock Exchange. It's called the DTCC. And the idea would be it's a central counterparty that everyone is just plumbed into it and everyone just trades with it. It's, a, it's called central counterparty clearing. And in fact, it's even more complicated. They created it a vault. It's over here in New Jersey. And all the shares got put in the vault. The vault is called CD and Company. And incidentally, there's a saying on Wall Street, three things you never talk about, God, politics, and CD and Company. I'm going to tell you why. Raise your hand if you own directly or through a 401k or a pension fund, any, any stock in any public company in America. Raise your hand. All of us with our hands up are incorrect. None of you actually, none of us actually own any stock. All the stock in America is legally owned by a company no one's heard of. It's called CD and Company. Believe it or not, it's the stock is put there, and then from it are generated, you can think of them as Polaroid snapshots of stock, that get put into the system to then trade, be exchanged for money, and it actually is more complicated than this, you have about 100 brokers wired directly into the DTCC, and then you have about 4,000 more plumbed into them. Now, what's going on when you think people are buying and selling stock, when you think, what's going on is there's just these share entitlements bouncing around. And by the way, besides this level, of, of that I've put red, red share entitlements, there's a whole other level. There are things now that are, you could think of another color, like a blue, it's, they're called ETFs. And what a blue share would be is a slice of a number of red shares. And there's ADRs and GDRs, and there's, there's basically, for, all, for the underlying, it's a system of fractional reserve banking without a reserve requirement. No one, unless you're really plumbed into Wall Street, people have no idea this how it works. It doesn't work anything like, when you buy stock or sell stock from your E-Trade account, you know there's some intermediaries doing something. What they're actually doing is nothing like you think that they're doing. And what you're buying and selling is not actual stock. And when I say, it's not just in custodianship at CD and Company, all legal ownership, the legal ownership, if you read your brokerage statement on page eight, you know, upside down backwards in Greek, as my father used to say, you'll find you actually don't own anything. All you have are claims of IOUs against IOUs against IOUs against properties someone else owns. There's far more, there's this daisy chain 
of contractual rights to actual property rights. Now, this is meshigous. This is nonsense. <clears throat> there are so many opportunities for cheating this system, and there are so many points of failure. <clears throat> and what there really are, are just like in, a mat in metal, there's something called the shear strength, you know, which is where when you bend metal, what's actually happening is molecules are flowing past each other smoothly. But once you reach the shear strength, the flow becomes jagged and chaotic. That can happen in this kind of a system. And in fact, it did happen in 2008, where people didn't know who they could trade with briefly anymore. That's when the US Treasury stood in, when the settlement system froze. I just saw somebody say that on TV, Bill Gross recently said that on TV. It's the first time I've seen that acknowledgement that that's what really happened in a way. Why the f government had to step in was this system sheared. Um, simplest solution is to take Wall Street as we know it and drag it behind the barn and kill it with an ax. <laughs> Instead, here's the essence of the crypto revolution and why philosophically it's so important. For 6,000 years, humans have had this choice. When we engage in consensual exchange, do I trust you? Uh, do I have to, well, I can't trust you if I don't know you, I don't, but let's say I'm trading you, you know, a, a camel for a coin for a gold coin, have you debased the coin or not? I can't know. So there's a business model. Whoever has a monopoly on, the poli on violence in an area can print coins, put his face on it, and say, if anyone debases this coin, I kill him. That we call that business model government, but it's, it's just a business model. It's a way to monetize the police power on a, of an area. Uh, so our choice has always been, do we have consensual exchange where we can't trust each other, or do we have institutions like that central counterparty clearing group where we don't have to trust each other, we each just trust it. So for example, in land titling, you buy this piece of land from me, I can give you a piece of paper, you don't know whether to trust the, t the paper or not, so we all agree there's one office. We go and that keeps the records of all the land registry. And on and on, civilization has accumulated these institutions which are effectively serving that purpose, solving the trust problem. Well, for the first time in human history, it's now possible to have peer-to-peer -peer exchange that's completely trustworthy. And what's going to happen is that's going to disrupt all kinds of business models whose function is to provide that trustworthiness to the system. A lot of those business models are corporations. A lot of them are departments of government. This takes, we believe, 80 to 90 percent of the cost can be stripped out of the system through this technology called blockchain. Now, when you apply blockchain to money, you get Bitcoin. And then you start talking about it that way, and people start talking about Bitcoin. Isn't that about a bunch of gun runners and, and you know, Mt. Gox and stuff? Well. Last I checked, gun runners and drug dealers use US dollars too. It doesn't make US dollars necessarily wrong. But the point is, it isn't about Bitcoin. This underlying technology, the blockchain, is going to have huge repercussions on civilization. And this isn't, I mean, I've been saying this for two years, and it's like I say, in the last six months, the financial world has gotten the joke. And for many major corporations on Wall Street, this is an extinction event. I'm about to show you. <clears throat> uh, so that's the point of the crypto. So all of this stuff is based on the mathematics that underlies cryptography, public key cryptography. So it's called crypto technology. Bitcoin and these other things, crypto technology enables peer-to-peer, -peer, yet trust. We don't have to trust each other. It's, you just have to trust math. Exchange. First time in human history we can have this. And why the, that's the, the cause of the deep political implication, there's all these social and political institutions that are going to find themselves disrupted very quickly. Because when you can, when you can come up with an alternative that's 90% cheaper, just the laws, the forces of economics say that system is going to be adopted. No government can stop this at this point. A year, two years ago, maybe they could have, but it's too late. The math can all be recreated in any grad department now around the world. 
and I've had opportunity to tell the U.S. government when I get subpoenaed about this and continually harassed. Uh, not that I care, but they, uh, uh, there's nothing. There's nothing they can do to stop this now. And it's and if and if they try to stop it, by the way, China's going to have it. Germany's going to have it. The U.K. is way advanced. Everybody has gotten since last summer. There's never been something like this in our lifetime. That this is so dis this is so disruptive on a world historical scale, and no government's going to be able to stop it. And to be honest, the U.S. government's the last one who even seemed to have that light bulb go off, because there's there's ministers and governments reaching out to us all over the world uh, uh, about and uh, about this and, and trying to get in. This is this is how it works. Think of true back to grandpa in a baseball glove. Uh, imagine they, they got rid of money and they just created a ledger. There was a ledger like your grandfather's hardware store ledger that he ran his hardware store out of. And it was cryptographically protected and it was public and transparent. Imagine some sort of magic ledger with these uh, properties. You could put, turn grandpa's dollars into just coins within this ledger and when he goes to get, take the baseball glove, when they settle, you're just writing, erasing a coin from his account and adding it to the other guy's account. You can imagine that. Now apply this to Wall Street, where you're back talking about stock, but it's not baseball gloves, but you turn the stock into coins, also coins, stock coins within the system. Now when grandpa buys some stock from the hedge fund, you've, you're taking away one of his coins and adding it to his and taking away one of his shares and adding it to grandpa's. Well, as simple as that sounds, you can replace this entire pig's breakfast of a settlement system, which only was invented in the 1970s. This didn't come out of a burning bush. This was invented in the 1970s. You can replace all of that with a system that runs at about 90% lower cost. So when you buy on E-Trade or Ameritrade, what you don't necessarily know, unless you're really into this, is that when you're paying that $9.95 fee, that's really going to all these middle intermediaries between me and you if you're buying that stock. There's all these hands in there, not just the brokers, but all these different but the DTCC and CD and the, the, this company and that, there's all these different places that, that those friction costs accrue. And that's become a huge drain out of the system. It's a huge tax on America. The whole thing can be disrupted. And like I say, everybody has gotten that joke in about the last six months. It's been the craziest thing. Every week you now you see another announcement, another bank throwing in $50 million trying to catch up on this. By the way, we seem to be the first folks in the world who figured this out. And we have five fundamental patents on it. And uh, we're sort of two years ahead of the world. And it's been kind of fun this time, you know, this having a two-year head start. And now in the last six months, there's suddenly everybody on Wall Street realizes just the enormity of this disruption. And they're all scrambling to catch up. So we've actually done it. We've used it at Overstock, did a bond with it. We're moving on to bigger things. Um, I'm going to stop there so I can tie that all together with other things. But that's my, my main point. I'll leave the liberalism versus social justice for another day and uh, what my misgivings were. Uh, but I'd like to stop there and take questions. And we can talk about liberalism and social justice, or we can talk about this crypto revolution. Sir. Uh, Dr. Burns, is there a chance that Wall Street's going to finagle their way into this uh, blockchain technology? That's a great question. They, uh, by the way, this gentleman supported me from years from afar. He's a fireman from Long Island, as I recall, who's uh, and, but, and now chaplain of his firehouse. But had I, over the years, I've gotten hundreds, if not thousands, of folks out there around the country supporting me in my fight with Wall Street, which I probably would have given up some years ago had it not been for this enormity of support across the country. And Joe was a uh, Joe McCarthy, first time we've actually met. Um, 
Uh, Wall Street wants to get on this in a big way. Uh, it's, it's something like Game of Thrones. It's the craziest. So I'm the most hated man on Wall Street. And I, two years ago, I was asked to keynote at the first global conference on Bitcoin. And if you look on YouTube under my name and Amsterdam, you'll see I went to Amsterdam and I sat around for five days and did the right and prepared my talk. I got up and said, this isn't about Bitcoin at all. It's about taking this technology and you can change history with it. Everyone ignored it then. It's seemingly Goldman Sachs, 14 hours later, got it's pat they must have watched the speech and then went and had a room full of lawyers work all day and at 4.59 that day, I gave the speech at 9 a.m. in Amsterdam and at 4.59 p.m. in D.C. they put in a patent for everything I had said. Didn't matter, I already had it all, so that doesn't bother me. But it's just, and then since then, see, so they're all trying to get in on it. What's happening, they would love nothing to change because if they stand shoulder to shoulder, they can continue extracting these big rents from you, uh, from your sister and a, it was a school teacher in Akron who's got money in a pension fund. There are, that, that crazy system that I described has all, not just points of failures, but all kinds of openings to steal, to, to manipulate. Uh, they would love nothing to change, but now they see there's basically three groups to be concerned with. There's the broker dealers, there's the, the exchanges like NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange, and then there's the settlement system itself. One of the three is going to get their hands on this technology and disrupt the other two. And dealing with them has been so fun for the last nine months because they know, I've got, what is it, Mark Twain referred to somebody as having the quiet confidence of a Methodist minister with four aces. I've got, <laughs> I've got the four aces, these guys hate me, and, but I got this and I, got, I have five patents. And so they're all having to negotiate with me. And uh, everybody understands that one of them is gonna disrupt the other two with it. And it's really, it's, but I'm certainly, and it's, the weird irony of, of my life that I've got my hands on this technology because, and I probably only saw it because of that long fight. I, by the way, that fight I was in with Wall Street ended a couple weeks ago, and I was paid, uh, well, I was paid $20 million in the settlement in the last check, but ultimately it was $32 million. I spent $30 million pursuing Wall Street, and I won $32 million from them but it also meant I got inside Wall Street. And the whole point of it in 05 when I started was just to get all this stuff and turn it over to the authorities and figure out and let them handle it. I didn't realize how difficult it was gonna be to convince the SEC they might be going out, they should be looking harder at Wall Street. Uh, anyway, I'm not gonna let them. It's such an irony, I'm not going to let them. I'm not, first negotiating point, any negotiation I en I've been entering into, is the first rule is you don't get, you don't get this. I'm not going to give give you control and then just trust you to do the right thing because you're going to bear it. It's like we have an engine that runs on water, and I don't want to sell it to Exxon. I don't want to sell it to anyone who can bury it. I want partners. I'll I'll take a partner in GM if GM will promise to put it in their cars and use it. I'm not going to sell it to any corporation that will bury it. And literally, if you think I'm exaggerating, just when you leave, Google the phrase Bitcoin Wall Street, and you'll see this freak out that has been occurring since about August. Suddenly, you've got the biggest banks in the world understanding they're facing an extinction event. Sir. Yes, when you say that this ledger, electronic ledger should be public and transparent, um, that means that it's going to be visible to everyone so obviously this could be applied for financial transactions and to transactions with equally. So take an extreme example. Uh, if I am having three penalties for dinner, I might not want my doctor or my insurance company to see that. So how transparent do you, what's, what's, the, what's the breadth of this? The breadth of There are many things which many of us don't want to be public and transparent, and perhaps for good or bad reasons. I agree. It can, it can be set to create total transparency so everyone can see what you're having for lunch. And our version, uh, uh, 
a blockchain-based capital market could be set so everyone could see exactly what it is, what shares you bought today. Or it can be set so we anonymize that amount, but the, everyone can see that your broker has put in an order for such and such shares. Or we can set it so people can only, the public can only see the amount of, trans, of total volume, in, but not to the brokerage level. And yet the regulators can see all the way through to the individual behind it. And for anti-money laundering and know your customer type reasons, we've built this so, we can, so the regulators can do that. So we, unlike Mt. Gox, we didn't build our version of this trying to evade the, the rules. We, I, we hired a legit big law firm, expensive, in the very beginning and said, we want to drive this right down the fairway and park it in front of the SEC. So there's no, there's no, uh, but it's set, it, they actually, in theory, not to say that they love ours, and there's two competing companies in this space, by the way, uh, and anyway, uh, Digital Assets Holding and, and uh, Symbiont. Digital Assets Holding is, anyway. Um, it can be set for any level of transparency that the regulators want. One thing it gives is immediate uh, audit trail. And after 2008, Congress ordered the SEC to develop a system where they can track individual orders. Believe it or not, if the SEC sees an illegal trade, and there's various kinds of illegal trades that get scattered across different exchanges, and they try to, it's called blue sheeting, they try to follow that trade back to its point of origin, it kind of gets dis disappears in a mist. It disappears into all that cloud that I was describing, all these layers of netting and pre-netting and, and continuous net settlement, all this stuff. So who's behind individual trades sort of gets lost in this mist of fungibility. Well, we have, give, and they, they've given up. The SEC, even though they were ordered by Congress to do this, and I think they were, grant, they were budgeted $500 million, have given up on creating a consolidated audit trail. That falls for free out of this thing we've built. So we can make it, yeah, you don't want people to know your stock trades, and we don't think they should either. We'll, we will set it to have whatever degree of transparency the regulators want and be able to give them total insight. Sir. And the impact on governments. Impact on governments is we're going to find a lot of things we pay them to do that we, they're like the buggy whip manufacturers. Land titling. I think I'm a big fan of the economist Her, uh, Hernando de Soto, also Jesus Huerta de Soto, but the Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto, who says the great impediment to development around the world has really been the absence of land titling. Takes you, if you're in Haiti, it takes you, you know, an average of 30 years and, you know, 200 little payoffs to petty bureaucrats along the way to stamp this and that. You know, your, you may have, your grandfather may have been living in this favela in Brazil, and your parents did, and you did, and you, go, and you can't get actual legal title to it because you can't, and it takes so many years. Uh, this economist says the real start of capitalism is when we, and the progress, was when we got land titling. Because then you have, A, you have a reason to improve your land because you've got proof that you own it and no, nobody's going to show up someday and say, well, you've got your records wrong. My grandfather had that. And secondly, you can pledge it to a bank and get capital to go and start a business. And that's really how the economic system turned over 200 years ago, as his point. If he's, uh, so one could create a land titling system that would run f at a fraction of the cost of current government. You know, people have no idea how much money is involved in land titling, but just to give you an illustration, Ontario, Canada recently accepted an offer for someone to run their land titling office, and they, got, they get to keep the fees. That company paid one billion Canadian dollars for five years. So they, they're going to run that office because they think they can, make, you know, by charging fees, you want to look up, see who owns that house. Well, that guy pay $500. You want to sell that house to someone else, you got to re-register the land, you pay 1200 
all those fees, someone is probably going to collect $2 billion over five years to do, and so they paid a billion for it. There is an enormous amount of money is actually caught up in that process, and that can, again, be reduced to something that's essentially free. So I think that's just one aspect of government. Here's another one. Now, I've got some, some former students of Milton Friedman here. I, I sense they may not agree with him on everything. I don't know, maybe. But Milton Friedman was once, in 1992, was asked by the Minnesota Federal Reserve what's the most important issue facing America. He was giving an interview to their magazine, and he said, the most important issue facing America is how do we get rid of you, the Federal Reserve. Thomas Sowell recently described it as a cancer on America that they asked him, well, what do you replace it with? He says, it's like asking what you replace a tumor with. You cut out a tumor. You don't talk about what you replace it with. The Federal Reserve is a cancer on America. Uh, I'm an Austrian economist, by the way. I'm not really a monetarist. I, I gave up on the So I think, you can, I think that we'll get away as the dollar fails. And the, the game plan was probably to go to something like an IF, IMF special drawing right to become the next level of, of fiat currency. And we've gone from a gold from gold from 1875 to 19. Everything lasts about 30 or 40 years, it seems to be, in monetary history. We had the gold standard, then I'm not sure what we had from 1914 to Bretton Woods. Then you had Bretton Woods from 44 to 1971. Then you had everything free floating from 71 until now. I think this is crumbling now. Uh, and the next plan would be to go to another level of sort of hypo hypothetical money, a like global hypothetical money. I think that there's an opportunity. Well, what's happening is countries which are facing Chernobyl, financial Chernobyl, are reaching out to me like crazy. Central <coughs> banks are reaching out to me like crazy. What everyone is realizing around the world is we're normally, when they reach this point in Latin America or Central Asia or wherever, that you, that your financial system, Chernobyl's, they dollarize their economies, and the economy becomes dollar-based. What they're realizing is you can do that, and sw instead of switching to dollarization, they can switch to Bitcoin or some, I'm not actually a huge Bitcoin fan, it can't, it does, Bitcoin specifically, but one of these cryptocurrencies they're realizing they can switch to. You know, Syria is currently shut out of Visa and MasterCard doesn't work in Syria. Well, everybody with a cell phone, and it could, you know, and every shopkeeper could have a cell phone and they could do things with Bitcoin. You could run sort of the basics of an economy on that. They don't need the whole modern global banking system. Uh, so I think that's, I mean, I was in a company in Silicon Valley that has a wall about as big as that back wall with 160 ideas like this of what you can disrupt. And it's big, it's backed by some billionaire guys who formed another, other four other big companies you know, in Silicon Valley. And their list of 160 things they can disrupt are things like the land titling system, the you know, issuing currency, money transfers. I mean, money transfers, people pay $500 billion a year around the world to send money home. Uh, I forget what they must, it's about a 30, 20 or 30 percent is what people pay as they, you know, if you're in, from Pakistan and you're here, Pakistan is a, has a large remittance economy. People work here, they remit money home. The friction costs involved in that are just so ridiculous and the same to Africa. That can all be made, taken to essentially zero through this technology. Uh, so I think there's a heck of a lot of government and a heck of a lot of corporations that are going to find themselves disrupted very quickly. It's not going to take 20 years. And by the way, this isn't like some, um, it is a pet theory of mine. I've been at it two years. You will see if you Google these phrases. This is, this is pretty much been realized now in all the corridors of power in the last six months that this is like a world historic event. Don't mean to scare anybody. This may be, as they say in, in uh, my the software developers say, it's not a bug, it's a feature. When they turn in something that doesn't work, it's supposed to be, it's not a bug, it's a feature. I think in the long run, this may be, a, this is a good thing, but in the short run, I expect some dislocation costs. And society will choose to accept them when the alternative gets too, is too worse, too much worse. So I 
Hello? Well, we have five provisional patents, but I strongly believe I was the first in the world doing this. Uh, and they are the use of blockchain and settlement, the intersection of ETFs and the capital, creating a blockchain version of the ETF industry. And if you know the ETF part of Wall Street and ADRs, <coughs> American depository receipts and global depository receipts, it's like a multi-trillion dollar industry now in the capital markets that can all be disrupted uh, by this stuff and made oh, I mean, the, the companies that we can go after, it's the, it's the craziest moment of my life, frankly, because we realize we have stuff that is currently being done by the bank in New York or this or that that we can do for 10% of the price. Uh, but so our patents involve ETFs in the capital, blockchain ETFs, blockchain ADRs, things like that, and just basic settlement. And it's all been designed, here's the key point, it's all been designed so that a whole bunch of the craziness you've heard about, the common denominator underneath a lot of the different scandals you hear about Go back to that cloud that I was describing, the settlement cloud. And who owns what is not nearly as clearly determined as you think it should be. Everything's made fungible at various levels and stuff. That can all be changed. And it's in that fungibility that there's enormous opportunities for theft. And the common denominator under a lot of what you've heard about, including the mortgage-backed security crisis, is the lack of one-to-one -one of true ownership. And that's all going to be uh, changed by this. It's really quite an interesting, I think in business, I've never seen anything like this in my life. So it's going to be an interesting few years to pay attention to. Thank you very much. What an honor it is for me. Thank you. <laughs>